Welcome everybody and uh, good evening to those of you who are watching at home. It's lovely to have so many people who are new, I think, to the Tortoise Newsroom have made the effort to come out on what are now all dark, dingy nights, I'm afraid, but it's it's lovely to have you here and thank you very much um, for making the effort for a very important um, conversation and event this evening that we're happy to be hosting in partnership with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. And um, we here at Tortoise were very proud uh, to report a story earlier this year um, it took us, a, I'm saying us, it was actually nothing to do with me, it was to do with my esteemed colleagues you're going to hear from later. It took a year for us to be able to um, bring this story into the public domain. Um, it was the story of uh, the MP Andrew Griffiths, who we can now say abused his wife. And the story was all working its way through the ramifications of the family court system we were prevented from publishing it and then we won the right to do that um, now james harding who's my boss and the co-founder of tortoise and when he was in a former life editor of the times did a lot of work in this area trying to bring greater transparency and reporting rights to what happens inside the family courts and as i say we're very proud to be working with the bureau on a project of which tonight is a part because it looks like that there is a new era about to come upon us of greater transparency of what happens inside that particular and particularly fraught element of the criminal justice system in uh, this country. Um, so I'm going to hand you over now because that is the extent of my knowledge of this subject <laughs> to the people who do know what they're talking about and to tell you a little bit more about the project in particular. Um, I'm delighted to have with us Emily Wilson from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Liz, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to speak very briefly and hand over to Louise. But we at the Bureau, so the Bureau of Investigative Journalism is a non profit investigative journalistic organization. And we first got involved in looking at family courts when we were investigating um, serving police officers who were accused of domestic violence and domestic abuse. And there was a, one particular case that was particularly shocking, but we were given legal advice very early on that we couldn't report any of it because this woman was going through a family court process and it was going to be impossible to report the details of her situation, even although it was nothing to do with what was being discussed at the family courts. We then, with Louise's help and with the help of family barrister uh, Lucy Reid, got subsequent advice and worked more on that and we were able to report the story um, and it was part of a series about a really important issue as we all know uh, that has become more and more uh, acute of the issues of serving police officers accused of violence against women um, now this uh it, but but the issues of the transparency and family courts basically delayed this one piece by about a year so a similar situation with the griffith story that um we had to pursue that for that length of time now we all know that journalism investigative journalism takes time and that is incredibly labor intensive but the, the, anything to do with the family courts we can double that, we can triple it, we can times it by 100, but it's incredibly important public interest stories that are going on. It's, it's incredibly important that we are able to do that job. And this is why we have been supporting Louise to try and find ways to make that easier for reporters and for families to be able to tell their stories and have the issues aired in public. So that's why the Bureau is involved. Um, it's great to have this partnership with Tortoise. It's great to have you all join us for this conversation. We are now pursuing um, a project to try and support this pilot project that's happening within the courts to allow some reporters more access to some courts and Louise can tell you more of that. And if anyone's got any other questions specifically about the Bureau <coughs> work, please do get in touch. But uh, thank you for coming and thanks very much for hosting us at Tortoise. Thank you, Emily. Evening, everybody. I'm Louise Tickle. And um, for the last eight years, and I only realised a couple of days ago, actually to the month, 
um, I have been working, trying to report on family court stories. And little did I know eight years ago when I first fetched up at the Bristol Family Court, um, what an incredibly difficult endeavour it was going to be, an endeavour that Hannah has been discovering over the last two years, um, and various journalists who have gone before us and editors who have tried very hard to support them and believe in their work as well. Here, um, who I will introduce you to later, um, is responsible for all the legal advice for the Times and Sunday Times that will hopefully help journalists get their stories into the public domain. So yesterday, the House of Commons Select Committee on Justice published a very long awaited report, and it was called Open Justice Court Reporting in the Digital Age. And very fascinatingly to me, the committee dedicated a whole chapter to the family courts, and I think that is a mark of how seriously they take the situation now. The stakes facing parents and children in family courts are pretty much unparalleled. And the report said the family court is one of the most significant but worst understood elements of the justice system in England and Wales. It deals with over 200,000 cases, so way more people every year, and considers some of the most challenging disputes including local authority interventions to protect children, parental disputes over the upbringing of children, and forced marriage protection. So there are huge interests, huge public interest issues here, and really enormous and life-changing and often very draconian powers exerted by the state, which is all done in an essentially hidden and unaccountable way. And for people who are not familiar with family courts, they might say, well, why is it hidden and unaccountable? And that is essentially because everything that happens in family courts takes place in private and to all intents and purposes, that means in secret. Although every family lawyer and judge and I have ever spoken to recoils in horror at the idea that they are presiding over secret justice. Um, in fact, that is effectively what it is. Though journalists who have an accredited press card are allowed to go and observe family courts, we can't report any of the detail of what we see during that court case um, or after it, unless we get permission from the judge. The interesting thing to me is, of course, the process, not just the outcome, because it is in the process and how that unfolds, the outcomes are decided. Um, that, that goes even if we anonymize everyone in the case, anonymity will not save you as a reporter reporting on family courts. Um, and if we do, it's a contempt, punishable by a fine or jail. And that is extremely chilling, not just to journalists wanting to go along, but to editors, to lawyers, to insurers. Basically, everybody is petrified. And I can say from experience that it takes very hard work to persuade a judge to give permission. And it's always time consuming, and it's often expensive, and inevitably, it is risky. Um, it's not a fun prospect for anybody. So the Justice Select Committee has listened to the evidence and yesterday came to the, to me, extraordinary conclusion, um, because I've been battling on this for so long, that um, the legislative framework in relation to reporting on the family courts is, in their own words, not fit for purpose and must be reviewed and reformed. So we have in our online audience the immediate past president of the family division, Sir James Mumby, who has always championed scrutiny and freedom of expression in the public interest, and who I know has been working very hard with others on a recommendation to the Law Commission to achieve exactly that. But in the meantime, <coughs> excuse me, before the law is hopefully at some point changed, what can be done to increase scrutiny and transparency and accountability in the family justice system? So what we're here to talk about tonight is what the president, the current president of the family justice system announced last year. So I counted it and it's 369 days ago, he published his transparency review. And in it, he said there had to be accelerated change towards transparency. Uh, so it's been over a year. I'm not quite sure how accelerated that is, but I gather a lot has been happening behind the scenes. And media representatives have been told that a pilot reporting project will start in the new year, in January. It's not been formally announced, um, but it's not information that has been embargoed. So can I have the first slide, please? Um, the three areas where the new, oh, 
I'm just going to say, see them. We've got a lovely picture of a map. But, oh, here we go. Um, the three areas where the new reporting rules are going to apply are Cardiff, Carlisle and Leeds and West Yorkshire. Um, and the headline changes to the current reporting ban, essentially, and I'll, I'll emphasise that this is still currently in draft form, are that accredited journalists, so people with a press card, they'll be allowed to anonymously report what they see happening in a case they attend. Um, accredited journalists attending family court cases in the pilot areas will be entitled to see documents that we currently have to ask slash beg for. Um, families will be able to speak to us freely. That's a contempt at the moment. Um, and this has yet to be clarified, but I think we will be able to quote them anonymously. Local authorities and court appointed experts will also be able to be named, um, and that is not automatic now. So we're all here tonight because of this new pilot. We wanted to mark a year since the president said that a new dawn had to, had to come. Um, and we have a panel, which I have um, a lot of pleasure in welcoming, who I hope will be able to talk about their experiences and also their hopes for the future. Bit of housekeeping, please, for anybody online, use the chat um, to ask any questions. They will be fed through to me and I'll ask as many as I can to the panel. Audience, if you have questions at the end, please raise your hands. Um, what we're hoping to do is for the talk to take about the next half an hour and then have 20 minutes for conversation. So joining us remotely, um, I'd like to welcome Angela Fraser Wicks. She has experience herself of the family court, which removed her two children for adoption. She's now a trustee of the Family Rights Group, and she has also been involved throughout um, the Transparency Implementation Group work to try and develop these new reporting pilots. Also with us remotely is Basha Cummings. She's an editor at Tortoise Studios, and she was the editor who took the huge leap of faith and very bravely commissioned me on probably the biggest and tensest story I've ever worked on about, as you heard, the former MP and Minister Andrew Griffiths. And in the newsroom with me are Pia Sama, the editorial legal director for The Times and Sunday Times, who has extensive experience of supporting journalists who want to report on family court cases. And next to her is freelance journalist Hannah Summers, who has made frankly Herculean efforts over the last um, 18 months and made numerous applications on her own, which is so daunting in the High Court and Court of Appeal in order to be able to report on family court cases for The Observer. So plenty enough of me. I'd like to hand over to Hannah. Would you like to start? Thank you, Louise, for inviting me to join the panel. Um, prior to about two years ago, my experience of reporting the family, reporting on family court issues was very much limited to reporting from published judgments, so judgments and information that was already in the public domain that maybe been brought to my attention through stories or were related to subjects that I was writing about. In the last two years, I've been attending hearings more regularly, and that has been in the Court of Appeal, as Louise mentioned, but also more often in private proceedings where I've had to make my own submissions to vary the automatic reporting restrictions. So the work is time consuming and legally complex. It's not just a case of turning up to court, witnessing what's happening and then writing it up. You do have to prepare your arguments and also that can also mean being challenged and having to think on your feet and responding to those challenges. So it can be quite daunting. When it goes well, it can be really rewarding, but I have faced a number of barriers when trying to do this work. And I can think of examples from every stage, really, from really practical things, just like um, accessing a court hearing, so getting the CVP link in time, getting hold of um, someone at the court and actually being permitted quite often someone might say we'll ask the judge if it's okay for you to attend and of course you have a right to attend and then at the other end of the scale facing occasionally quite hostile challenges from barristers and sometimes unclear directions from judges on what i can or cannot report and whether intentionally or not this can come across as an effort to discourage me from reporting or discourage me from reporting certain aspects of the case even when things have been quite straightforward. So for example, I can think of one time I had a judge who was incredibly helpful 
um, gave me permission to report and provided me very promptly with court documents that I needed and a written court order that I could show the lawyer at my newspaper I was writing for. But even then, right at the start of the hearing, they'd said to me, I'm letting you in, I'm permitting you to come because this case is in the public interest. And of course, it's not for judges to deem what, what, what we should be reporting, what's in the public interest is something, obviously, that as journalists and editors that we would judge. So I think that's just to give an example that even when there's really good practice and judges are quite proactive, there's still things that illustrate perhaps that to have a journalist in court is exceptional rather than something to be expected. Um, I can only really talk about my personal experience because Louise mentioned there's such a vast number of cases that go through the family court and only a tiny fraction of those um, are witnessed by journalists. But basically what I've found is the current setup really presents quite major challenges, both in terms of transparency and public interest, but also from a journalistic perspective. So on a, as a reporter on one side, you have to work really hard to convince a judge to let you publish. And on the other side, you need to convince your editor to put that time and resource into something that could ultimately prove fruitless. And I think fruitless, and you might not get the permission, um, you might not be granted permission by the judge. And I think that um, that's where these reforms have the potential to be really transformative um, in that with the um, reform to, to the section 12, that we would then hopefully see more press coverage of um, public interest cases. Thanks so, so much, Hannah. Um, can I go now to Basha Cummings? Basha, are you, are you there? Hello, yes, Hi. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, I mean, what I wanted to offer really was just my experience of working with Louise on the Griffith story, um, which was a real education. As somebody who hadn't um, come from a court reporting background, hadn't been involved in stories um, relating to, to family court proceedings before, it was an education in how courageous you have to be as a newsroom, having the backing of an editor who accepts that it's going to cost a lot of money often, um, particularly in the case with um, the Griffith story where we needed representation uh, in the Court of Appeal, as well as um, for Louise, we needed to seek not just our own legal advice, but also um, uh, get the services of Lucy Reed, who's an amazing uh, powerhouse in family court proceedings. Um, it, it felt like at every stage we were being challenged to think about what is the public interest in this case and be really clear about that because the culture tells you this is private, this isn't something that you should be listening to, you shouldn't be thinking about publishing. And it really does chip away at your resolve to, to think, it, are we doing the right thing here? And with Griffiths, I think it was a very clear case to say this is a person who was in a position of power, who was found to the civil standard, not a criminal standard, to have abused his wife. And it felt like perhaps a case going through a family court where the public interest was much more black and white than I can imagine it is in other cases. So it it was, I think, for us, um, not a difficult equation to think, OK, this, this is a serious story and Louise needs our support. And we thought carefully about how we would tell the story of the outcome of that case, but also the process that we had to go through in order to, to make it public. Um, but thinking about as a newsroom in terms of our responsibilities of how to reflect the, dif the difference in, in standards of proof. So how would we make sure that we were being clear that this is not a, a criminal case, that this, this was all the result of a, of a private this dispute? Um, how we would, I guess, hold the public interest at each stage of our fight to, to make um, the story public and what kind of arguments were we prepared to make that we thought that later would be reportable and how that would reflect on us as editors and as journalists. So it was, it was for me a steep learning curve and I guess a real education in a 
culture of secrecy that is is kind of telling you over and over again you shouldn't really be here um and of course it, in the end we won and that, that it felt like a, a great victory for our argument and we we you know the story was worthwhile uh for many different reasons but you know i followed um hannah's reporting it, you know i i can see how it can over time really chip away at the sense of you know it, as a journalist that you're doing the right thing um, and I think the court reporting pilot is a way of really testing um, some of those principles and I guess strengthening them. Lovely thanks so much Basha. Um, so Pierre, when journalists come to you and they say we've got this story can you give us a sense of you know how you approach what your experiences are? Well, the family courts are what everyone here is saying, and I just really admire somebody like you, Hannah, and you, Louise, that has, you know, goes in there by yourself to try and challenge these, the, the culture, the position, um, because it's the wrong starting point. And it's the one area where all the lawyers and my team will say to a journalist, you know, you can't report from the family courts. Um, and that's the starting point, because it is, it is a fact. You, you can't. It's only exceptions where you can get in. So, you know, that must be a huge deterrent to know that that's the answer that you're going to get. And I'm sure it puts people off from even looking at half the stories. Um, but as I say, that it's the wrong starting point. And that's the problem that we've got, um, because it's contrary to just to go back to basic principles, the principle of open justice, which is that, you know, you must justice must have, must be seen to be done. Um, and there's you know, the, the old adages that are quoted in so many cases, particularly in the, the central case on open justice, which is Scott and Scott, is that publicity is the very soul of justice, which is a quote from Jeremy Bentham. And it's just, it is at the heart of everything that happens through the court system, but it doesn't happen in the family courts. And the principles behind it are, to, to look at the other side of the coin, valuable and valid. Um, a lot of them are to protect the interests of children. And I don't think anyone would want to thwart that principle. But it's the way it's used as a cloak, as a veil for embarrassment, yeah. and the way that it closes the door to scrutiny, which is why I think your work on Griffiths was just so, so significant. And what, what you were saying, Basher, about the public interest, because what happens in, in the family courts is a starting point is you can attend, but you can't report. And it's a contempt to report under Section 12 of the Administration of Justice Act. There's also anonymity, which is statutory under the Children's Act. So you've got these two immediate bars. So you've got to apply to lift those bars or start to talk to the, to the judge about how you do that. And only if you get to that stage will the judge then exercise his or her discretion to weigh up the public interest versus the privacy rights in that whole setup so it's not just the privacy rights of the children it's just the starting point is this is private um, and really the public interest you're looking at there is the public interest in in what in european jurisprudence is called article 10 so that's the right to freedom of speech so your right as a reporter to communicate to the public what's going on and the griffiths case is saying it's not just saying is it that the family courts are should be open it's saying look at what's happening under the story so this is this is all about domestic abuse and this is about coercion this is about the veil that's taken over these relationships and how they're played out behind closed doors and i think those examples are i think basha said very black and white and they're strong cases to take but even those are hard yeah. and there are much more <laughs> nuanced arguments about the public interest mm -hmm which are huge deterrents for a, a, a law firm or a, um, a legal department in a, in a newspaper, if you've got one at all, um, because the arguments are, are really quite complicated. You need representation and you're, you're arguing against that starting point. Um, and the other massive thing is it is discretionary. So because the starting point takes you to that point immediately, there's the balancing exercise, which is Article 10 versus Article 8. Article 8 is the right to privacy, which includes the right to private life and covers the rights of, of children and of families and, and all of that sphere is instantly you know private if you talk to a divorce lawyer or a, a lawyer who specializes in custody of children you know, they're horrified by the media trawling through things because they'll say you're going to misreport it you're going to put everyone in a bad light you're going to get it wrong um emily dugan at the sunday times wrote about baby bruising last year mm. in the sunday times and the, yes, the times applied to to lift section 12 
and we made quite good arguments that were successful about the public interest. Um, but again, the starting point there shouldn't be that we have to do that and we need a legal team to do that. The starting point should be it's open and let's look at how we can protect the interests of the child. No one wants a, a baby's name necessarily on, on the front of a newspaper or on the internet. It's, that's not what, what we're looking for. What we're looking for is the underlying issues. And it's organisations like the local authorities or social workers, carers, and how, how those decisions are being made. But it's also the attitude of the judiciary. Um, because there's so much power in this discretion and the ability to exclude information, Publicity is the, is the soul of justice. You need to have the eyes of the public through the journalists um, to be able to challenge quite, quite simply the mindset of judges because they don't always get things right. Um, and society is moving at this rate and the law is always chasing it, in my view. You know, it's always one step behind. Um, so how do you, no disrespect to judges, but how do you educate the judiciary? Well, by challenging it. Um, so that discretion has to be challenged. Um, and you can only do that by getting into court and doing that. But look how difficult it is. So I think I think putting the judges on the spot is, is part of it. And barristers. And, and barristers, yeah, people who present the case. And the way that the case is presented is so is so dry. Um, to try and get the, the issues of society or the questions that you're trying to raise into that is also quite a challenge. Because you basically you you you're just challenging the status quo. But you're trying to say, look, we need to know about this because things are changing. People are talking about coercion in marriages. People are talking about marital rape. They weren't 20 years ago or whatever it is. You know, people are saying that women who look after children in that situation are, are being unfairly treated. Domestic abuse, all of these issues are require judges to keep up with the times. So how are they going to do that? I think some of the interesting questions in the chat are what you touched on, you know, the privacy rights of children are the reason why this law was enacted in the first place. And so I wonder if we could now come to Angela Fraser Wicks. And Angela, I'd be really grateful if you could address from the point of view of somebody who's been through the family courts, the concerns that people have about children's anonymity being breached through through reporting, through greater reporting. Yes, um, thank you, Louise. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, I'll give you sort of a very quick whistle stop of my own lived experience, which is all I can speak about um, tonight. In 2004, I was a victim of what Louise quite rightly called the draconian system in the fact that my children were permanently removed and placed for adoption. And I that was it. They were gone. I was no longer a parent. And this was predominantly due to the fact that I was a victim of domestic abuse. Now, I completely agree that we need to be protecting the identity of children. But at the same time, we have to be shining a spotlight on the reasons that we are removing children, because we've got the, the argument and the balance between protecting children's identities, but also the fact that we are removing children permanently and causing untold amounts of damage long term. And if we don't actually scrutinize why this is happening, then we can't always be saying that we're acting in the best interests of children, which is what all of the arguments tend to come down to. This is in the best interests of the child. And, you know, I spent 15 years after losing my children desperately trying to raise awareness of what had happened, why it had happened, trying to campaign for change. And I did that in a way that successfully protected my children's identity there was never anything said or done that could have uh, revealed who they were but if I'd had someone who could have helped me shine a spotlight on what had happened maybe slightly earlier on it might not have taken 15 years for me to actually get to the point where people were listening and people were starting to actually acknowledge that we are permanently removing children from victims of domestic abuse and that actually we need to be doing something about that and we need to be addressing that so I think we have to be thinking about the children from the beginning to the end but it isn't just about whether or not we're protecting the identities of children it's whether we're protecting children full stop throughout the whole process. Angela what would you say are family members main reactions to the or main suite of reactions should I put it to the prospect of, of journalists fetching up in their private family court case and like in these three areas Cardiff, Carlisle and Leeds having the right to report anonymously the details of what they see. Um, it's been mixed. 
and obviously I can I've only spoken to a few family members because obviously a lot of this has been embargoed and I wasn't able to to sort of spread it out to to the wider population but the first one was fear and the fear was around the fact that they already feel when let's face it there's a huge power imbalance in the system and they were initially very concerned that this was going to be yet another stick to beat them with that they were the journalists wanted to expose them their parenting or but once it was explained to them that this was about scrutinizing the process and policy and about trying to maybe address some of that power imbalance then the issues were around anonymity and protecting their family but they were on the whole quite keen on the fact that actually this might actually go somewhere to start raising awareness of the issues that they're facing day to day and and and, and as you say just the fact that nobody really understands what's going on in the family court so it's very difficult when you are going through the process to be able to talk to anybody or to explain to anybody what's happening because it is closed and it is secret so I think there's there's some skepticism but I think that with the right amount of of information provided to families that that could be overcome i think there's going to be in these three areas the most enormous culture shock to the judiciary to the barristers to the solicitors to the local authorities at the idea that journalists will by default assuming things go to the plan i've seen be able to report will be able to speak freely to family members without anybody being terrified they're going to be clapped in irons um hannah i know the culture is something that you have come up against and i wonder if you could give us a couple of examples of what it's been like recently so stories that you know i've heard from you um about your time in the family courts and also can you think of ways of helping to combat that culture mm. shock yes i um I suppose when you turn up to court, um, the way you would like to be received is as someone who is just doing their job, so the eyes and ears of the public, um, there to report um, in the interest of open justice. But often, well, from time to time, not always, but it, you can be received with an air of suspicion. And I would go as far to say sometimes even it can feel quite hostile mm. maybe um and obviously the courtroom is naturally an adversarial environment these are cases of high conflict um the parties might be quite tense um and that's natural um but yeah i would say i can kind of give examples the other day i had a barrister say that his client did not want me to have the skeleton arguments because they didn't like my tweets. There was some kind of complaint about something I tweeted, but they didn't expand on that. So it was a very vague criticism. This was an open court and it was in front of the president of the family division. And I was on video link at that point because I, I was out of the country. So I was attending remotely. So it was quite hard to interject or defend myself. And I think that is, you know, to come to, to, to have a curveball like that where you're not expecting it, it's obviously quite unpleasant. Um, it was obviously a tactic because, you know, they obviously don't want me reporting on that case. But um, yeah, I've also what had... What happened? What happened was I... I wasn't able to respond at the time, but Brian Farmer from Press Association, who was in court, said, well, that would be ridiculous to give the skeleton argument to me, but not to Hannah. Um, and the president said the whole point of the skeleton arguments is so the reports can be fair and balanced and accurate so it wouldn't make sense to do that it was obviously the barrister obviously knew he wasn't going to win this argument but for whatever reason they felt necessary to have a have a dig i suppose it feels um, quite shocking when that happens don't yeah it was yeah. quite taken aback i was there it was an open court i'd sort of tuned in and i was like this should be you know we're obviously able to report this i don't have to make submissions and go through the whole process so i was a bit more relaxed than usual and then i was like what they're talking about me and my tweets um but yeah i couldn't i didn't know what they were talking about he wasn't specific so 
um, I wrote to an email actually to the court to, during the hearing and said that I would like the opportunity to respond. So it was part of the court record that I strongly refuted that my reporting was anything other than fair or accurate. And I took exception to being criticised um, without notice and without the opportunity to respond. And I understand the president is he didn't receive the message in time before the court rose, but he says he's going to address it at the next hearing because it's been adjourned. So other times I've had um, barristers ask quite forcefully as well and quite persistently why um, why their client uh, wasn't given notice. They weren't given notice that I was going to be in court. And we don't have to do that, do we? And we don't have to do that. And it's, you know, fair enough if somebody's feeling a bit nervous there's a journalist there and they don't know what that means but it's up to someone's bar it's up to someone's legal team to prepare them and to reassure them or explain to them why journalists are in court and what that means for them um yeah i've had barristers ask me how i find out about a case implying implying what wasn't my client um and i have to say whenever but it's not the only time that's happened. And I have to say every time a barrister's made a guess or an assumption or insinuation about how I've come to know about a case, it's been wrong. And there are lots of ways that journalists can find out about cases. I'll just and, stop you um, there and ask Pierre, because you were talking about culture. And so you're a lawyer, and I think you probably understand the way that lawyers operate better than as journalists we would. Um, what's your impression of the way that journalists have been dealt with within your news organisation? And, and can you think of any ways of helping to change that culture in those pilot courts? It's going to be really interesting, isn't it? Because I think that cult, you see that culture amongst family lawyers and practitioners. It's not the judges this time I'm going to have a go at. It is those practitioners. Um, because there's, there's a fear of a loss of control over mm -hmm. the case um, and a fear of people pitting their cases against each other and leaking which of course is is problematic you know you can have people who want their cases to be played out in the media i mean i would say those sort of cases are in the category of the high profile very wealthy individuals who would leak their their stories to the media and the same is probably happening mm -hmm. on the other side mm -hmm. um so they don't deserve much sympathy but i think the the family practitioners um yeah are are mortally uh fearful of either leaks jeopardizing their client's case yeah. um, which is protection of their client's interests so i think that's absolutely legitimate you know you would always say to your client do not do anything to jeopardize right. your case you don't want to upset the judge you don't want to be accused of leaking you don't want to be accused of subverting the principles that are going on in here in, in the courts but i think once you remove that contempt risk over the over the heads of mm. people talking to journalists mm. that should be something that the practitioners should be pausing to think, do they want to talk to the journalists? Mm. If they do, they're free to, there's no contempt hanging over their heads. So I've got to let go a little bit here. I've got to let go of the control of this of this story. Mm. But I, th I think, you know, I've never been a family practitioner, but communication with your client and sort of taking yourself away from just thinking about how you present the case is a big part of what they do mm. and looking after your client. And if it is in your client's best interest to communicate with the press, given that the press are now going to be able to report in, mm. in, these, in these pilots, um, it's going to be another skill set that they're going to have to learn. And in other areas of the law, criminal courts, for example, um, practitioners are much better versed with dealing with the media and they deal with very sensitive issues. Yes. Um, and they do have to talk, talk to their clients about it. And I think there might be a whole new world, perhaps growing up around PR and representation and you know, claimant lawyers who look after their clients' interests, the ones who can afford it will go to the big law firms, just yes. the way as they do yeah. um, in other areas of the law. Thank you. I'm going to come to Basha and Angela in a minute, but I want to read out a comment that's come in online um, from Katie Preen, who says, this conversation is very much along the lines of good faith, public interest journalism, but we know there are many, that we know there are journalists who may choose to report in a more sensationalist way. How will we prevent open reporting from being abused? And I think that's a really fascinating question because there is no doubt that different types of media report different, you know, can report in fact the same case very differently. And I, and I remember, and I won't remember it precisely, but there was a really tragic case um, that was reported in a judgment. So a judge had released this judgment, published it, and it was about a mother who had had, I think, seven children removed, some of them sort of subsequent babies, and she was pregnant with the eighth. 
and it was one of the red tops and it was just this awful unfeeling headline you know mega mum with bumper brood you know with you know her seven babies removed and eighth on the way and they hadn't breached any reporting restriction but can you imagine the tragedy for that woman that she would have gone through those experiences and those removals and even though her name wasn't mentioned the feedback i got from barristers who knew that case was that in her local community they did know and of course they would of course friends of hers and friends of friends would know that that had happened to her and then she's there all over the tabloid press in this very derogatory way the worst things that could happen to you had happened and now she's being vilified and i totally understand that how you prevent it um okay right well basher <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is a fair question to come to you with. What I was going to ask you was what had, and I suppose we can kind of mix this in, is what advice would you, as, a, as an editor who commissions these kinds of stories, would you give reporters, you know, either reporters based in these kinds of areas who want to report on these stories to, to deal with issues in a way that is not going to harm people? What a question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think the... The thing that I was really clear on when we came out the other side of the Griffiths case and we we had some really, you, well, you'll remember, we had some very anxious moments um, towards the later parts of the process about once we had made our argument and, and framed the argument. And I've seen a lot of comments in the chat about, you know, how do you protect um, children and, you know, I guess balancing as judges do balance the rights of a child, the rights to privacy, the right to a family life with, with um, the public interest. I mean, that watching lawyers and judge and a judge and, it, and later three judges balance those competing rights was a real education for me in terms of, you know, I guess how to frame an argument, how to think about the ethical and moral implications of a public interest argument, and how to be clear about what it is that you think you want to say and what impact that will have. Um, but I think having been through that process and learned about how rigorous that is, um, I think the conversation that we had at the very beginning between Louise and I about why we thought this was a, an important story and and what it was that was going to give us the I guess the energy and the motivation to stick with it was really came from that initial conversation that we had which was why should people know about this w what is it that we will learn by making this argument to to have this in the public domain and I mean I, I haven't worked on more nuanced kind of gray area cases where a family um it, there, there was no question that we would make this argument if Kate Griffiths the mother wasn't on board that we would not make this argument without her and once we knew that we had her support it felt like we had a kind of clear run at what we wanted uh, to try and report on um so I think being clear about navigating the relationship with the with the family or or who it is that you're trying to do this on with or on behalf of and also being clear from the very beginning what is the argument that you're going to come back to time and time again when you are challenged either in court by other barristers or by the judge what is the thing that is that you will feel comfortable arguing no matter what's thrown at you and with the Griffiths case it just came down to this was a man in power who behind closed doors had been found to have been abusing his wife and we felt that whatever else would come out that that was in the public interest and one thing actually I think Hannah mentioned Brian Farmer who anyone who's met him or encountered him in court will know that he is just a legend in this world and I learned so much about the position of a reporter in the family courts from hearing him speak and making his own arguments um, he said something that will really stay with me well two things actually um, one is he said that Boris John at the time Boris Johnson was prime minister hence that argument uh, that example he said Boris Johnson could be in the family courts and you wouldn't know about it and it and it you know some somebody who holds the highest power in the country the highest office could be could be found to have to be doing terrible things behind closed doors and there's no reason that you would know about it and that feels wrong 
he, he also said that the way that he has started to be able to read the court system is he's started to decipher the otherwise completely anonymous numbering systems that appear throughout uh, the family courts. And that again, felt just sort of mad and archaic and wrong that, that only because he's been in that system for so long and he's spent so much time in those corridors that he can navigate that world. But anyone else who, you know, comes across a particular story or comes from, you know, comes through on one particular case will have no hope of trying to build a system of reporting or, or build out from that without enormous investment and support from a newsroom. And, you know, newsrooms have to make decisions about what they cover and what they invest in. And I think the family courts can seem very daunting and expensive um, as a scene of reporting. So I, I thank you. Um, I've, I've had a thought as a result of what um, Bash has just been saying about how you might be able to prevent sensationalist reporting. I mean, it's, it's not that you would be able to prevent it, but the idea that the only journalists who will be allowed to report freely from family court hearings are the ones who go and sit through them. They are long. Sometimes they are really boring. They can take days, if not weeks. I think it's unlikely, I mean, it's certainly possible, but not very likely that somebody who only wanted a sensational story would be prepared to do that. The kinds of stories I've seen doing that very sensational thing are usually ones that are, are taken from judgments, in fact, where a journalist can see what's coming up on Bailey or the National Archives now and runs through them and sort of thinks, oh, right, we can do something quick and dirty here and it doesn't cost us any money and we're allowed to do it and we can make something big out of this. But if you've sat through a family court case for days and possibly over weeks and months to follow it through, it's unlikely your newsroom would, would have released you to do that, which, was, which is what would give you the freedom to report in the way that we're talking about, unless you were going to do something serious. So I, although it's not a safeguard, I think it possibly provides some level of reassurance, maybe. Um, I want to read out something that Becky Bell has said in the chat. Does having a journalist in the courtroom impact on the way that judges behave? <laughs> um, I do hope so, because they can dehumanise you. Um, yeah, so I think that's interesting. I won't, I won't ask you to answer that question yet. Maybe you can have a think about it, Hannah. Um, Angela, um, are you still, I can't see you, but are you still there? I'm oh, you still are. here, oh, yes. You're still here, that's great. Um, what would you want to say to a reporter in one of these pilot courts who turned up and it was your case? Goodness. Um, I think what would have been really great for me would have been just to be seen and be heard. I'd got so lost in the process and had almost started to believe the things that I was hearing said about me, the things that I was seeing written about me. And I think it would have just been I mean, looking back, it's quite difficult, but I think it would have just been really great to have well, somebody actually want to listen to my side of the story because I, you know, I approached my local authority for help and then suddenly found myself fighting to keep my children. And, and I couldn't really comprehend how that had happened and, and what had gone wrong and why sort of admitting that I needed some support had suddenly turned me into the enemy. And, and you know, the, the fact that, being a victim of domestic abuse meant that I wasn't protecting my children. And I think to have somebody who could have actually shared that, because I was then ostracized from, the, not just from my immediate family, but within the community, because people assume if you've had your children removed, you have done something terrible to them. And it's very difficult to be able to prove that you haven't. And I think, you know, just having somebody there who could have said, well, actually I was there, <laughs> I heard what was said. <laughs> And would that would you have felt had if there wasn't just somebody there saying that, but if you had had your story published in a national newspaper, even anonymously, but people around you had known, would that have felt very shaming? Yes. But saying that, I don't know if it would have felt any more shaming than the fact that everybody knew what had happened anyway. You know, everybody in my town, everybody that I knew, everybody that I grew up with, everybody knew because towns gossip, people talk about things. And I then made the decision to start telling my story myself because I cared slightly less about the blame and the shame that would be brought upon me and more about trying to raise awareness of what was happening in the hope that it might help shift the blame and the shame for other people. But yes, I think there is a very real risk of this being 
misreported and it actually making that blame and shame feel greater than it already does. But actually thinking about it, I'm not entirely sure that there is anything that feels worse than everybody you've ever known your entire life, knowing that you had your children permanently removed, but nobody really knowing why or what happened and making their own assumptions anyway. So maybe if I'd been able to, to share my story, then people may have actually realised what had happened and how easy it was for it to happen to other people. Thank you. We've got about 10 minutes left. So if people in the audience can start thinking, if you have a question, can people start putting their hands up? And if you, are there any hands going up? Oh, splendid, Ellis. <laughs> can somebody hand, oh, Ellis, you actually have the microphone. Brilliant, could you ask a question? Is this on? Brilliant, you're welcome to speak. So I report so much in criminal courts as my job, and I've only been to family court one or two times for a lot of the reasons we've already been discussing about the hostile, very archaic and almost like a, a front that kind of blocks journalists from having the confidence to go. And court staff in the criminal courts tend to get more and more friendly as you as journalists go there. They're very welcoming and they give you the information they want you to give that, you, that you're after that you're after. Family courts, the staff are quite affrontive. They demand your ID the second you walk in. They and then I've I've been sat in a uh, foyer outside of a family courtroom waiting to go in, listening to a man's barrister, a his ex partner's barrister, and then the baby's representative. Uh, and then as soon as I declare myself to the usher that I'm pressed, they come up to me saying, "Why didn't you tell us that you were press? We're we're we're, we're very concerned now about what 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 you've heard heard and." For me, that was just offensive anyway, but I just wonder what's it going to take for the kind of structure around the family court system to be as accepting to journal of journalists as the criminal system is? Whoa, as accepting. That's a high bar. Um, any thoughts, Pierre? Yeah, maybe just a little bit more accepting. OK, <laughs> thank you. What's it going to take the family court system and culture to be more accepting? of journalists, if not as accepting. I mean, listening to Angela talk, it does, it reminds you of actually the, the, the pain of the, the small sacrifice, the, the smaller individuals in this big picture, the sacrifices they actually are making by having their personal mm -hmm. affairs yeah. spread across the pages of a newspaper. Um, accepting maybe with the bigger hits of actual reform in law, where you have a, proper issues being aired about domestic abuse, about marital rape about all these bigger issues where there's actually where you can see that your part in this contributes to a to a bigger picture um but i, I think it's going to take years mm -hmm. and i think it's i'm afraid i think it's going to be very difficult i think mm -hmm. i think the family courts are absolutely moving in the right direction because the the justice system seems to now accept that it's in the wrong place and that the starting point ought to be open justice and and they seem to be putting the children's rights right at the front and saying we'll take steps to anonymize children we'll make sure that the children don't suffer but the knock-on effect on a family often affects a, a child mm. um, and that's going to be very difficult to to navigate through um, what's going to make it more accepted i'm not sure i'm not sure it's ever going to be as accepted as you mm. say it's a very high bar and i think it's always going to be a very painful environment to be in and to report from and it, Going back to the question you asked me before, that the knee-jerk reaction for any good lawyer protecting their client mm. is to keep them away from the mm. glare of publicity, because you're looking at those immediate rights of the individuals you're looking after. You're not looking at open justice. You're not looking mm. at you know great big mm. issues about publicity as the yeah. soul of justice and all those high-minded things that I sort of spouted. It, that's not your issue. You're concerned about your family. Um, so it's going to. I, I'm not sure it's ever going to be achieve parity, to be honest. Hannah. Any, any ideas? I think one thing I keep thinking of that I'll just mention first is that in the criminal court, we deal with very sensitive cases involving children and we manage to protect their anonymity. So I don't know. I don't see why that can't work in the family court. And in terms of the question of how can the family court, when will there be a cultural shift? How could it be more welcoming? I agree that that seems like a very, like that's going to take a long time. But I think for that to happen, we just need more journalists going into court. Um, and that's only going to happen if people are aware of these changes, if they're aware of the pilots, but also if there's an appetite for these stories from editors. Mm -hmm. And that means there needs to be the investment and the budget for these, to, you know, 
to run these stories, basically. Yes, yeah. but I suppose something of the reality of it is, is that not every ordinary family tragedy is going to be the matter of reporting. No. So it's, okay. it's the, you know, the Griffith stories are the ones that you're really pushing on, which are so fundamentally important. Mm. And, hopefully, and, and to have those aired and to, to be able to take away the use of the courts to, to protect embarrassment or being used as a veil for just mm. to protect private rights. I mean, those are the cases that really journalists except, and reporters should be looking that, at. I, mean, I think that there's enormous value in reporting the more ordinary yeah. ones as well, because that's going to be the vast majority of the ones that happen in the district courts mm. and in this, you know, in, 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 under circuit judges before anything gets to the high court. And, and in fact, the Griffiths case was just in, you know, it just started in the Derby family court and mm. that's all it was. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. There have been some lovely comments about Brian Farmer. He is an absolute legend, lovely integrity and morals. And somebody else, echo comments on Brian Farmer. He doesn't pull up the drawbridge of knowledge after him, which is a really lovely thing to say about a journalist who, and I would completely agree. Um, any more questions from the audience? Yes, I can see so. Oh, Geraldine in the back. Has, can somebody pass Geraldine the fluffy green mic? Um, this is something I mentioned to Louise briefly yesterday, but um, we, I worked at, um, previously at a tabloid newspaper where um, a former partner of a celebrity, I obviously won't say which one it is, came to us saying that she'd been abused by him and she wanted to do a story on it and to get sort of tell her side of the story. And um, it had been, there had been a fact finding hearing in the family court and he'd been found and obviously on the civil standard um, to have assaulted her three times and we obviously couldn't get that over the line um, it was it was before the, the Griffith story and, and things like that but I just wondered if um, there was any way of if you weren't in court for the hearing is there any way of doing these things retrospectively like can you apply for like retrospective permission to report or something like that if it's you, in the you can interest? it's hard <laughs> <laughs> because everybody then has to be put on notice everybody troops back to court it's really tough <laughs> yeah, I, I have done it, mm. but I did it with a barrister mm. and we won. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another quick thing from um, Mark Hanna, who used to be, until very recently, one of the co-editors of McNay's Law for Journalists. It's clear from many judgments on open justice matters that senior justices, senior judges, e.g. those of the Supreme Court, believe that judges are more likely to be just if there is prospect of their conduct and decisions being made public. Um, I, I would tend to agree. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any final questions before we... Oh, yes, um, yes, please, please, bring, bring that... Yeah, you've got the Really quick one. How secretive are the equivalent courts in the rest of Europe? <laughs> um, I, I know a little bit about some of them. I don't know if anybody else has any knowledge. You, you okay, um, so I went to Ireland to look at their system. They did actually change their law in the way that the Justice Committee is suggesting we change ours. And they did that, oh gosh, about 10 years ago, so the journalists can go and report. Um, they still have a very big sanction, um, a 50,000 euro fine for, t for journalism, that for anything that is reported that tends to identify somebody, which is still really chilling. In Australia, I think private law cases, as in divorcing or separating couples with a dispute over children, are held in public. I don't think public law cases, which are child abuse and removals, are held in public. Um, I don't know much about anywhere else. In general, in countries like Germany, the, the Article 8 rights prevail. So, in the other privacy words, rights. privacy rights are paramount. OK, well, we're coming to... Oh, one more question from Adam, and then, we, then I will wrap up. Uh, just, a, um, just a quick question on, the, um, on, the, on anonymity. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know much about anonymity in the courts, but I, I do know that... Um, uh, it, uh, in uh, medical research, it's not possible, it, it was judged not to be possible to anonymize medical data. With, with, a, with, a, with few enough data points, anybody mm -hmm. can, be, can be identified. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know that it, um, the best efforts of everybody to keep things anonymous, and as you said, uh, talking about in Ireland, um, you know, something that might tend to, mm. any data point is going to end up identifying people potentially. Yeah. I mean, I think that's going to be one of the challenges of the, of the pilot, because where do you get to when you have as a journalist access to some documents, you can report what you've heard, um, but you've still got statutory anonymity for the, for the children, 
Um, and it's the jigsaw identification, which is always the most tricky part. How much of a story can you tell when you're not able to identify a child? You're going around the edges. And as you say, data points, all of that information can be pieced together. Um, Anne, have you got anything that you'd like to add on that, on anonymity and how to, how to, if not ensure it, at least bolster it? I suppose there's always the provision for the judge when they make their order to identify things you cannot report beyond the obvious things like the names. Um, and I think that if there's a risk of jigsaw identification, then that should be considered and they can redact other elements of the case at that point. I think what I'd say in answer to that question is that you cannot have any reporting without some risk. What you're trying to do in the way that the transparency order will be shaped, so there are certain things that we won't be able to report at all, and then there will be other things that might well be subject of negotiation in court. So, for instance, if there was a Somali family in Carlisle, where I don't think there is a big Somali population, the, the, you might, the judge might say, do you need editorially to put that information in? There will be times when editorially it will be highly significant, but you might not need to say Somali, you might need to say something else. There are many occasions where I have worked with barristers on trying to work out what I needed, what I wanted, and what I could you know, let go. And, and you end up in a bit of a sort of horse trading situation, but all you can honestly do is say that you're going to reduce the risk. Um, and I think that we need to be honest about these things. I'm going to wrap up now and say thank you very much to my lovely panel for being here tonight. I really appreciate all your time. Um, thank you to Tortoise for hosting and to the Bureau for co-partnering on this event. Um, the Bureau has been very generously funded by the Treebeard Foundation and the Seba Foundation to support journalists who want to report on family courts. And to that end, we will be launching a microsite on the website of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in early January to provide additional resources for reporters who might never have gone to a family court before and who feel anxious about going. I still feel anxious every time I go. There's always something new, always something you're not sure about. Um, Emily Wilson and I are currently working on the content for that. We are awaiting publication of the final transparency order the final reporting rules. Um, so everything that I've said today is, is still in draft form and has not been completely signed off, but we hope that it will be by the judiciary in um, a few weeks time. Um, so that's all really folks. Thanks very much for coming tonight. It's really lovely to have an in-person event with so many of you here. And thanks to everyone for logging on from home. Thank you very much. <laughs>